financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vonning. You're listening to the Vonu Podcast. And welcome to the Vonu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Well, at least eventually when we get to the action portion. Two more episodes after this one. We're almost there. I'm Kyle and... I'm Shane. Thank you so much for tuning in and we hope that you've had a pleasant week. Shane, why don't you go ahead and bipcot this thing for us? Sure, Kyle. I'd be, I'd be honored. Uh, since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vani podcast is covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. All right, this episode is entitled A Case for Non-Coercion Based on Rational Self-Interest, and the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com slash 11. So what's on the agenda for today? Well, we'll be reading and discussing an article published in Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, with that same title. It was originally published in Invictus in December of 1972. So to give you a time frame, right around the formation of the anti-libertarian libertarian party, and I would say long before the non-aggression principle, that is what he was talking about after all, was widely adopted or discussed. I think it's safe to say that, again, Rayo is ahead of his time. So, Shane, do you have any opening thoughts? I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, this, I posted this article on uh, on the on, on the other show I do, the other website, and because uh, there was a lot of uh, you know discussion about the non-aggression principle and, and where it applied and where it didn't. Uh, and I think Rayo's uh, Rayo's article is very very valuable uh, in that uh, you know he was kind of he put things he put what people were trying to explain. Uh, in, a, in a very succinct article, so uh, I think it's I think it's very very valuable, and uh, you know we are dealing with the philosophy section here, uh, so so yeah, keep that in mind. Three more three more episodes till the action, but I think it's uh, it'll be interesting to kind of get Rayo's view on uh, the non-aggression principle, which wasn't coined that at, uh, at his time, but uh, he was really describing the same thing. So that's that's kind of all I have so far. All right, let's uh, get on with it. So again, the article title was called A Case for Non-Coercion Based on Rational Self-Interest. And what we'll do, ladies and gentlemen, is we'll just kind of go through the article, which isn't very long, and just kind of go through it step by step, so to speak. So Rayo begins, quote, The ethical principle of non-coercion can be stated. One should not initiate the use of physical force against any volitional being or against property created or acquired through voluntary consent, close quote. So let's just go over that one more time, because if you don't understand this, the rest of it's not going to make any sense. One should not initiate, I mean, this isn't pacifism, okay? One should not initiate the use of physical force against a volitional being or against property created or acquired through voluntary consent. Now, Shane, let me ask you something. So do you think this ethical principle of non-coercion, as Rayo has defined it, is the same thing as the NAP? I do, yes. I, I, I think it's exactly the same thing. Uh, and, and, and again, you, you mentioned something important there. It's not pacifism. He's talking about the initiation uh, of the use of force. So uh, I think that's kind of a, a, an important thing to, to toss in there, too. And I want to mention this, too, Kyle, that, uh, you know, th- this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't, a, you know, like a libertarian or anarchist podcast, per se. This is a, you know, a podcast about Vonnie. So uh, I think it is, it, it's also important to kind of, you know, we're laying out, you know, the non-aggression principle here, essentially. And, you know, the audience may may come from, from, other, area, uh, from other areas that, you know, might be interested in some other things that Rayo had to offer. Like, it could be some anarchists here. Uh, who you know don't understand the non-aggression principle uh, uh, or, or or something along those lines. So uh, I think that, again, this is a, a very good first step, uh, <laughs> considering uh, the the audience could be wider than, than we think. But yeah, I think he's 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 essentially explaining the non-aggression principle here. Yeah, and before I get on to the next portion of the article, let me just ask ask you a follow because I I was kind of debating this with with within my own head, as it were. Do you think 
that now the non-aggression principle, the NAP, is non-aggression. However, Rayo says non-coercion here, the ethical principle of non-coercion. Do you think aggression and coercion are, are synonyms or maybe there's a slight difference of meaning? It's a good question. I mean, obviously, aggression is pretty clear cut, right? If I hit you in the face and we aren't like in an organized boxing match, like that would be aggression. Uh, now, coercion can just be a threat. Uh, it, could, it could just be a threat, but um, I don't know. That, that's why, like, you know, non-aggression better because coercion. And, and he didn't. He hasn't defined coercion here, but I, I think he might have done it other 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 places in the book. But yeah, I mean, d depending upon the definition of coercion. Uh, I mean, uh, the, I guess that that could be kind of an issue. Uh, so that was definitely that was a good good point you brought up. Uh, yeah, I guess that there there could be a difference, but uh, we we aren't starting from a definition definition of coercion here. So right, uh, and so <laughs> and so to be fair, I think the point of commonality between what Rayo called the ethical principle of non coercion and then what ANCAPs and voluntarists and libertarians more generally call the NAP is it's a prohibition against the initiation of the use of force. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. So, you know, even even if there was a slight difference of meaning between the word coercion and the word aggression, the point is that Rayo's ethical principle of non-coercion is, as he stated it right there in that first sentence, is saying the exact same thing that the NAP is, which is a prohibition against the initiation of the use of force. So. Yes. Yes. So yeah. Again, one should not should not initiate the use of physical force. So even if. Uh, uh, you know, even like even the the ethical principle of non-coercion, how he how he kind of like the, the terminology he uses. I mean, yeah, they should not initiate the use of physical force. So, uh, you know, in regards to you know the uh, the, the coercion versus aggression, uh, I, I I think you know I think that that, that provides some clarification. Uh, but again, you know, I, I'd like to I'd like to you know you know have a definition of coercion first. But uh, I guess that's the only qualm here with this. <laughs> of course, and I think it's important for the listeners, especially if this is the very first time they've heard any sort of real, uh, dare shall I say, philosophizing about like what the wor meaning of words is uh, for for any particular word, as well as you know what is the initiation of the use of force and i think you mentioned a moment ago like if you just go and punch somebody just because you feel like it that probably would be one type of example of it, of the initiation of the use of force which of course is different from self defense because self defense is um is valid and otherwise does not violate the nap i would assume would not mm -hmm. uh, that self defense would not violate this ethical principle of non coercion as as rayo himself put it Indeed, indeed. Yeah, you're right. All right. Now, let's now having beaten that horse to death and saying things four and five times over, because for some people, especially if this is the first time, they may not understand initiation of use of force. That's that's kind of that's kind of the core idea here. And so, uh, yeah, if you didn't understand it the first four or five times, you know, re-listen to this portion again. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to continue on. Quote, many people espouse this principle, but most arguments for it are mystical or altruistic. Some are blatantly so. They invoke God's will or the good of society as a whole. Others are more subtly so and talk about natural law or innate rights without clearly defining those terms, close quote. Yeah, Shane, wasn't there that one guest you had on on the uh, LUA series, the, the fellow who didn't like rights or, or thought it was like a bad concept or inaccurate concept or such? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was Daryl Becker and we were, we were talking about, you know, do, do rights exist? And uh uh, you, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think Ray was right for pointing this out because most people talk about natural rights or, you know, rights or civil rights or whatever. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the term rights typically, you know, comes like as like a privilege from government. Uh, so, so that's, that's automatically a, a negative aspect there. Uh, but yeah, I think Ray was good for pointing that out. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, natural rights, natural rights. Uh, you know, Rothbard talked about, talked a lot about that in the ethics of liberty, but, uh, you know, uh, as Daryl kind of mentioned in that, I, I, I mean, uh, not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with the trivium method. If you aren't, uh, go, go look it up. We aren't going to go into that much here. But uh, uh, he, he kind of uh, posited that, uh, you know, Rothbard didn't do his, uh, his grammar work uh, very well when he, ch when he chose uh, the, the term natural rights or he chose to, you know, uh, extrapolate upon the term natural rights. So, yeah, I think Ray did a good job, you know, kind of pointing that out here. Uh, because a lot of people just use, use the term rights, you know, uh, all loosey-goosey. Uh, the right to food, the right to internet, the uh, the right to bear arms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
Uh, I mean, the right to bear arms, obviously, you know, not not a bad one, but uh, but still, still, it's the concept of rights uh, uh, in general. Well, I mean, it's like the whole notion of the civil rights movement is kind of one big farce because it's all about democracy and elections, right? Um, it wasn't even necessarily about uh, certain demographics of uh, one type of human or another, right? It's all about promoting uh, the God that failed, which is democracy. It's all about promoting political crusading, which are the elections and, and so forth, right? And it was kind of interesting here, too, because elsewhere in uh, the Vanu book, Ayn Rand was mentioned by name. And it's very interesting in this one paragraph. Multiple times. Right, yeah. and it's very interesting in this one paragraph here uh, that Rayo mentions is that he's basically emulating actually a concept that was mentioned in uh, the infamous 50-page John Galt speech that's in part three of Atlas Shrug, when uh, Galt is mentioning about the mystics of spirit versus the mystics of muscle. And so when Rayo mentions about, but most arguments for it are mystical or altruistic, some are blatantly so, they invoke God's will or the good of society as a whole. Well, God's will, that's mystical, and the good of society as a whole, that's altruistic. You know, the, the muscles of spirit are the mystical or God's will explanation versus the altruistic um, <laughs> mystics of, of muscle or good of society as a whole. Uh, in other words, you have your uh, more religious dogmatism and more in the context of like divine right of kings. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you have the more uh, more. Uh, it's true, a more secular but still collectivistic uh, thing about, oh, the common good, right? Oh, it's for the common good. We're one more law away from utopia. Go, you know, come join us and be our, you know, join our socialist fascist paradise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and I think you're 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 definitely right to bring up uh, Ayn Rand because as we mentioned, I think it was the very first uh, the very first episode. Uh, yeah, that was kind of where he came from. You know, the the objectivist. Uh, he was he was at the uh, Nathaniel Brand Institute, so he was very. I'm I'm guessing he was very studied in, in Ayn Rand. Uh, you know, that is what kind of you know kicked off the the first Free Alice movement. That uh, you know kind of led him. Uh, that that failure led him to to Devonu. Uh, so yeah, def Rand definitely had some influence on. I mean, I think I think that'll become more evident as we kind of get get further here. But uh, but yeah, I think he was very studied in Rand. One more thing, too. I think it's rather interesting that in terms of like the good of society as a whole, that's very much that sounds a lot like uh, collective movementism, doesn't it? See previous episode. Hmm. In a manner of speaking, yeah. right? So we all need to get together to do, you know, go for this particular goal of whatever the movement is about. And because it's collective, well, it's for the good of society as a whole, but we're still trying to going to mystically uh, resist the government in our collective movementism towards whatever, right? So, I mean, how is that different from the good of society as a whole? Well, yeah, yeah. We need a libertarian president because it'll make everyone more wealth. It'll ever make everyone wealthier. Everyone will have a better standard of living. And worse, uh, <laughs> what about? And worse, think about this: if the thing about God's will, if that's divine right of kings, wouldn't social contract theory be the good of society as a whole as well? Ah, these are just two different justifications for the state, now, isn't it? Or at least could be. <laughs> indeed. Well, indeed. let's continue on. Quote. Some supposedly egoistic arguments for non-coercive-ism are merely reformulations of Kant's categorical imperative and thus mystical. One example, quote, If I deny inviolate rights of all others, I cannot claim such rights for myself. So a critic might respond, My recognition of inviolate rights of all others will predictably have only negligible effects on what rights, if any, all others consider inviolate, assuming no god who enforces uniform rights. Another example, I don't initiate force because I'd rather live in a world where most people don't. A critic might respond, I too would prefer such a world, but I have no reason to believe that my conduct will significantly affect the conduct of the world's population. Close quote. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, isn't Rayo kind of criticizing Max Sterner here? Uh, to be honest, I'm not I'm not too familiar with Max Sterner, so uh, I, I think he's he's an egoist, isn't he? Yeah, the the, the so-called egoist yeah. oh. anarchism with uh, the, the well, well, yeah. well, hold on, hold on. To be fair, the whole notion about exorcising the collective spooks from your mind that came from Sterner, actually. Ah, but okay. this was okay. also the same guy who was saying that we need to have a union of egoists that is formed through an act of will and some of this other very flowery language. So Sterner is a mixed bag from what relatively little I've read of him. But yeah, uh, the ego in his own was actually his manifesto uh, that, that actually 
set up that uh, that kind of egoism thing. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, Ayn Rand was about the ego too, wasn't she? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I also thought it was interesting too that Rayo was equivocating uh, the categorical, the categorical imperative as being mystical. And it's kind of interesting. I never really thought, I mean, for those of you folks who actually study political philosophy in any real detail, I never really thought of the categorical imperative as being mystical. Um, you know, at most, maybe collective movementism, but that's kind of really debatable, arguably. It's just interesting. He equiv It's interesting that Rayo kind of equivocates it with basically uh, in a more metaphysical context. And it's just, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe Rayo's on to something here. I mean, what do you think, Shane? Well, to, yeah, to, yeah, to be honest, I, I read a little bit of Kant uh, in higher level indoctrination college. Uh, you know, there's a, he's, he's, he's definitely, you know, kind of one of the first ones. To, if you take a, a, like, a, 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 like an entry level uh, college uh, philosophy course, you're going to read some Kant. I mean, it's just, it's just going to happen. Um, but uh, I, I remember uh, uh, there was one interview I did with a gentleman named Matt Pataglioli who, uh, he's, uh, you know, kind of an Austrian economist and, uh, you know, more studied in, in this than I am. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have some, my own issues with, with, uh, with, uh, Immanuel Kant, but, uh, but, but his kind of explanation was that, you know, Kant's categorical, categorical imperatives can be taken, like they, they've been taken in all sorts of directions. Uh, <laughs> so, so it, it's definitely possible that, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the way that Rayo's using it here, uh, uh, could be, could be another use for that. Yeah, it's quite possible. Anyway, let's continue on. Uh, quote, To base non-coercion on rational self-interest, what must I show? Only that I can expect overall benefits from adopting it, i.e. from espousing, internalizing, and habitually acting in accord with it. I need not prove that coercion would never be in my self-interest. My decision to embrace or reject an ethical principle is not the same as my decision on action in a particular situation although the former may decisively affect the latter. An ethical principle is only an abstraction, and like any abstraction, only approximates what it represents. Someone's conception of A is not A. A map is not the territory, but maps and other abstractions are often useful, close quote. Um, I, I guess that when he was mentioning about a map is not the territory, I, I think he's trying to draw a distinction between something that is real versus something that represents something that's real. Yeah, 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 possibly, possibly. I want to mention this too. Uh, so, so he says that uh, only that I only that I can expect overall benefits from adopting it. And this is something. I mean, even for, even for folks that uh, you know kind of criticize uh, you know the non-aggression principle, or uh, as as Rayo called it, the ethical principle of non-coercion. I mean, uh, you know, uh, life is uh, you know life without conflict uh, is is or life with as, as little conflict is is you know typically better. People don't uh, uh, people don't, uh, typically try to avoid conflict. I mean, obviously there are some who, who kind of like it, but uh, but I've realized that you know when I don't go around you know uh, bashing people's windows or punch people in the face or shoving people in the shopping mall that. Uh, you know, things are things are uh, more peaceful. I think that's kind of what Ray was getting at here. Is you know, I guess I guess just to just put it simply, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, li living uh, uh, living your life without uh, you know the initiation of force is it's probably uh, probably uh, um, better off and and, and will will lead you to to better places. I guess is, is kind of what what I'll leave it at. Well, let me just kind of add something here that I don't think a lot of people would really consider. You know, I like talk, uh, talking about argumentation ethics, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it was also on a previous episode we did of TVP. Um, just to kind of refresh everybody who may not have yet listened to the, uh, I believe it was the collective movementism episode, because mm -hmm. I wanted to kill collectivism dead. Um, argumentation ethics, simply put, is a logical proof that demonstrates the performative contradictions within any political ideology except for some variants of libertarian anarchism and usually some sort of propertarianism or respect for private property, uh, even without the state, right? So it upholds the validity of the non-aggression principle by showing that individuals who argue with each other have not only forsworn coercion, they are also affirming self-ownership because they are exercising property rights within the very act of arguing itself. So to put this a little bit more simply, argumentation ethics as a concept insists on integrity by opposing hypocrisy. And in a lot of ways, it can be used to debunk socialism a lot more efficiently than uh, Ludwig von Mises did in Human Action, which was, of course, a much more utilitarian approach. So I, mm -hmm. I would just say this. I, I think Rayo is, is almost acting in some ways like a moral relativist here. At least that's the impression I'm getting. Maybe I'm misunderstanding him. Maybe not. Uh, maybe the listeners could direct their hate mail to uh, Kyle at vanupodcast.com. 
But suffice it to say, man, I don't know. I, I'm getting the the impression from Rayo, at least thus far, that he's being a moral relativist. But if you go to argumentation ethics, which was formulated by Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe much, much later after this article came out, I don't know, man. I, I, I think Rayo might have uh, made a misstep here. Hmm. Hmm. Moral relativist. I I don't know. I mean, if you look at he says, I need not prove that coercion would never be in my self-interest. I think he's kind of just leaving that door open. Um, it's a good point. That's a good point. But uh, hmm. I, again, even if I was right, I wouldn't completely blame Rayo because remember, he's ahead of his time here. This was written, you know, like you know, said mentioned earlier in the 70s. Right. And Hop came up with argumentation ethics or formulated it in the 80s. So, again, I don't want to let uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good here. I'm just si simply saying I, I think there's a better way. But, uh, but, but yeah, just for the listeners to keep in mind that Rayo was such ahead of his time that— and I think that's a good way you put it, Shane. He was trying to keep the door open in, in terms of, like, uh, philosophizing and such. And, and also, too, I mean, if, if he did try to go about proving that coercion would never be in his self-interest, it would be, be a lot lengthier article. Yeah, it would. Um, it would be a lot, a lot a lengthier article to write uh, on this typewriter— uh, in his uh, polypropylene A tent, or polyethylene A tent, or whatever it was, some plastic tent. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so, so I, I, I think maybe he just kind of, uh, just kind of, you know, left that there, and then just kind of, you know, uh, you know, tried to pick up and, and prove what he was trying to prove. Uh, you know, the the, the ethical, uh, uh, the ethical principle of non-coercion. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't think he wanted to get into it all that much. Uh, <laughs> right. And and one more. Now, now maybe, and and also this is a possibility too. I mean, this is from Invictus. Uh, and uh, you know maybe there maybe there were further articles on maybe this was a series he wrote. Uh, I mean maybe he exp expanded upon this. I mean we just don't know because we don't have you know all of the copies of Invictus. You know the back and forth conversations, the articles, all of that stuff. So I mean uh, um, maybe he left the door open. Maybe he you know uh, you know cleared that up in a later article. I don't know. I, I I don't know. But that that's kind of just another thing to keep in mind here. Yes, exactly. And so I I, I would just kind of. One more thing before continuing on uh, with the rest of the article. Everyone just kind of please keep in mind, and I think this was mentioned in the very first episode of TPP2, is that Ray was an engineer, I believe, by profession. Mm -hmm. And so when you compare that against Hans Hermann Hoppe, who is a philosopher by profession, I think that, uh, I think that significance is, is quite well significant. And even Murray Rothbard brought that up when Hoppe first proposed argumentation ethics, because Murray Rothbard himself, as an economist, admitted that he kind of mm, screwed up a bit by saying that there was no way of in a value-free way determining principles and that Hans Hermann Hoppe has basically done what was formerly thought to be impossible and Rothbard praised Hoppe for that. So I, I think that's kind of important to keep in mind that, you know, what somebody's like profession is or, or generally what they do to make their livelihood in a lot of ways can actually influence how they go about philosophizing. Yes, yes, and speaking of influence, I mean, yeah, more Ayn Rand, and I mean, more, more. Uh, you, you can you can see the influence of Ayn Rand even more. You know, A is A and A is not A. So, right, and so uh, just <laughs> and know. so the influence of objectivism, even as more of an influence more than anything else on on Rayo, I think is is uh, quite significant. Uh, moving on here, quote: In rare situations, initiated force may be in one's self-interest, and holding a non-coercive ethic internalized as a habitual response will mean loss. But this doesn't prove that adopting the ethic was irrational. Any principle is adopted prior to the situation. The probability of overall benefit or loss judged at the time of adoption is what is significant. Close quote. Now, just to be clear, for the umpteenth time, initiated force would be coercion and or aggression, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... That's interesting. This doesn't prove that adopting the ethic was irrational. I don't know. I'm still getting relativism here. What do you think? So, so let's say I, I, I don't know. I guess that the best, the best, the best, I guess, response I can provide is you know, pr pr provide an example. Uh, let's say that uh, you know, I don't like it, it, it. It's hard to provide an example for that too, though, too, because it's like okay, you come across a guy on the street, and okay, well, if he's co if he's if he's uh, threatening you, if he's you know beating you up, I mean, that wouldn't you know fall into and to and that wouldn't fall into what we're what we're trying to discuss here but okay let me put it this way okay mm. let me let me just do a quick hypothetical before we continue on i guess it might be a initiated force maybe in one self interest it might be the case if you were to go and rob pacifists like if you know for certain they're never going to engage in any form of self defense whatsoever i guess that yes in a very utilitarian 
Actually, you know what? Now that I think of it, maybe that's what Rayo was getting at. Maybe he's coming at this from more not maybe not not relativist, but maybe more utilitarian approach, much like Mises, perhaps. In that, um, you know, whatever works works. You know, kind of in you know, of course, that geez, that that can awfully get arbitrary at times too, right? Because how do you define what works at any point? You know, what works for one man may not work for the man standing next to him. I think that was a good example. Though. That that was kind of what, that was trying to that was what I was trying to suss out, but it just it just didn't it just didn't come to me. But yeah, you know, robbing pacifists because they're not going to actually use any you know uh, defensive force against you. So yeah, I mean, if if you didn't do that, I mean, yeah, it would be. I mean, uh, I guess as as per this article, I mean, I guess it would be a loss. Uh, I, I I wouldn't call it. I don't know if I'd call that a loss though. It'd just be kind of neutral. I mean, you didn't gain or lose anything. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, again, this is why Murray Rothbard said that argumentation ethics was really kind of a third position to both the deontological or, or philosophical or natural law, natural rights tradition versus the more utilitarian uh, approach to uh, libertarian ethics and so forth. And so like argumentation ethics is the a priori justification for the private property ethic. Uh, but that's not what Rayo's doing here. He's kind of going, I think, more on utilitarian grounds. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I think I only mentioned this once before. I'm still getting reading through Human Action by Mises, so I'm getting a full dose of you know, of a, a yes, a priori, but it's still a very utilitarian approach, right? In terms of like you know Austrian business cycle theory and some other things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you read Human Action, right? Yep, I sure did. So anyway, <laughs> let's let's continue on here. Quote. In, similarly, in some automobile accidents, one is more apt to survive if not encumbered with a safety belt. But this doesn't prove that habitually fastening safety belts is a mistake. Overall probabilities of survival, non-injury, are what count. Close quote. Um, I don't have anything to add here. Do you? <laughs> nope. No, okay, next. Quote, most critics of non-coercion ethics espouse situation egoism which is hold no general principles except this one, always act according to self-interest as perceived in the situation at hand. Such a critic might say, why encumber yourself with principles? Why build spooks in your head? Why not play it by ear? Close quote. Okay, Shane, I can say this for certain. When he says situation egoism, he is talking about Sterner. <laughs> just, just not naming him by name, I guess. <laughs> no, and, and so I think we've left the more objectivist notion of e of egoism and now we're getting into more sterner's pos and by the way max sterner's uh egoist anarchism or whatever that particular uh school of uh, thought was uh was very relativistic by the way so the way that rayo's describing it is actually quite accurate where it's basically you are flying by the seat of your pants and even says why build spooks in your head that's straight from sterner yeah yeah and I think I think you know before we discuss further, I think the next paragraph, the next par paragraph is Rayo's reply. So we might want to cover that first before sure. we, you know. Yep. Quote in reply: At any time, I can consciously consider only a very small part of what is around me. I must deal with most in my environment through habit and emotion. So the development of generally appropriate habits is to my advantage. If I can walk over ordinary ground without deliberating about each step, I can better think about what is around. Close quote. Yeah, so so I guess just just I'll I'll chime in here for a moment, but I, I mean I I guess the the only kind of disagreement I or the only disagreement I really have is you know I I don't see any negative of you know like adopt like the like the non-aggression principle adopting that you know like you you know adapting that or adopting that all the time because the only time I would need to use force at all would be defensive force and that kind of falls outside the purview of this so I this article is important but I I, I don't know I. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, I mean, this is kind of one of the things with, with I mean, with, with when you cover like philosophical topics. I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you can get uh, into all sorts of nuance and minutia, which kind of is the philosophy, the philosophy field, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think there's a little too much of that. Anyway, uh, quote: An ethical principle, when internalized, becomes habits and attitudes. So the central question of this article reduces to: Is developing non-coercive habits and attitudes in 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 my rational self-interest. So is developing non-coercive habits and attitudes in my rational self-interest, close quote. Well, that's rather interesting. So are we still going on utilitarian grounds here? Or maybe more relativistic grounds like I've suspected? Maybe both? 
I mean, I don't know, man. This is why I like argumentation ethics is because you can prove something in the moment and we don't have to do like 20 million goddamn different studies over, you know, 50 million different types of human action. We can kind of like look at something like in the moment and then kind of gauge it universally, whether it's true or not. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's kind of walking through, and I and I think you know you know those who who haven't you know looked into philosophy at all, or you know you know as much as I despise you know high level indoctrination. I mean you know like some of those uh, introductory classes. I mean I enjoyed my first philosophy class. It was the only class I ever destroyed, or the, that I only that I ever enjoyed in in high level indoctrination. Um, but it kind of gets you in that like that that philosophical thinking. Uh, it it, it kind of gets you into you know how how to think about philosophy because it's, it's a different field than anything else. And I think if you know if uh, someone just came across this on Google uh, that had never looked into philosophy at all, I think they'd be confused as all hell. I mean, we, so there's there's egoism, uh, there's kind of the objectivist influence, then there's the you know the the non-aggression principle, which is more kind of like the the voluntarist sort of thing. Uh, I mean, it, it's there's a lot. I mean, this is I think this is he, he's making things more complicated than than they need to be. But again, when you consider you know the the, the the time he wrote this article, or when he wrote this article, it it, it makes sense. It makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, again, the the engineer mind. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm not sure if he if he really explained things as well as you know you know like a philosopher would. Have. Or maybe he's he's overthinking it because that that also happens too. I mean, the nice thing about argumentation ethics is that it does obey Occam's razor. At least I think it does. You know, it's very simple and to the point. You know, e even people who are at least of average intelligence, actually, maybe even below average intelligence, could probably understand the basic idea behind argumentation ethics, even if they don't understand all the terminology. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say most people could. I, I've explained it to a couple of people, uh, and one of them got it, and one of them would just kind of like, um, okay, huh. <laughs> so, like, just kind of like the starry ad look. So, I guess it just kind of depends upon the person you talk to. Uh, but yeah, especially like this article, yeah, a little, uh, what a, uh, maybe he is just uh, overthinking things. I don't well, know. Well, again, uh, like he said, is developing non-coercive habits and attitudes in my rational self-interest? I mean, that almost sounds like a very utilitarian question, which, of course, you see, this is why I don't like it when people who mean well but are more of a utilitarian uh, bent try to explain, like, the evolution of human liberty to statists and other authoritarians is that all that the statists and the authoritarians have to do is just whip back around and basically accuse the utilitarian or even relativist of saying, well, uh, being that, well, you're being arbitrary. And then they would kind of, you know, there, there's not a real rebuttal to that. Other than maybe saying, well, life is shades of gray. And then, of course, the status could then easily come back and say, well, you just admitted to shades of gray. They're therefore government or in the servile society and such. So mm -hmm. I don't view moral relativism and or any sort of utilitarian justification for the, for the imperative of human liberty, or in this case, Vanu, um, to, uh, as, as very convincing, right? I, I think at the end of the day, if you have, I mean, Shane, maybe you've noticed this over the years. Uh, there's always kind of the, the question about how do you spread the message of liberty, being the typical libertarian question, right, among the various uh, proselytizers uh, of the faith, as it were, right? You know, how do you spread the message of liberty? And I don't see really how any sort of approach based on any purported notion of utility is, is very convincing. I mean, quite frankly, and to be perfectly honest, like my first book was admittedly mostly a utilitarian approach to explaining why different elements of political crusading doesn't work. You know, specific actual techniques and all that. And for some people, I guess it would be beneficial if they're actually curious about that. But except for a very minor portion of that book, it doesn't actually get to the core of things in a more ethical or, or um, uh, philosophical manner, right? That wasn't the focus of mm -hmm. an elusive phantom of hope. That wasn't the focus, and I freely admit that, and I've said so before. So it kind of depends. Gosh, I, I hate to sound like you know shades of gray or whatever, but different people respond to different things, right? Some people are more of a philosophical bent, and yet other people are more, you know, nuts and bolts and very uh, materialistic in the sense of they need to understand the basic uh, building blocks of, like, the physical universe around them. And thus, once they fit the different, you know, jigsaw pieces together, then they can step back and look at the broad picture, kind of like a mosaic, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, man. Anyway, unless you have some ad, I'll keep going.
Yeah, I guess the you you made a good point there, and I mean that that's why I like you know uh, like just you know uh, again like I, I like the non-aggression principle. You know, it's it's such a simple explanation, and it and, you know it relates very 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 well to uh, you know uh, uh, you know Christians or Christian conservatives or whatever. I mean, it's essentially just the golden rule applied to government as well. Uh, so it, it's a far more simpler you know uh, thing to explain. It takes about you know ten seconds. And uh, you know it can be easily be picked up. Oh, it's it's oh it's like the golden rule, and they 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 consider the, the like the the government as as you know an aggressor. Huh? Okay, interesting. Rather than you know going into you know uh, egoism, or now there's something called ego utilitarianism. What? Uh, just a bunch of like it, I mean it. Yeah, it, it it's uh yeah for for the average individual, uh you know not <laughs> most people don't uh you know uh, read through you know the entire history of philosophy or. Uh, or, you know, look into, you know, Austrian economics or things like that. So, I mean, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, what, what the non-aggression principle is a much easier explanation than, you know, kind of, you know, what he's trying to lay out with uh, the ethical case for non-coercion. But again, consider the time frame, but that's all I have. Well, I mean, even if you look at the twin precepts of libertarianism, if you were to really boil it down without the more precise philosophical language, what it really means is don't hurt anybody and honor your contracts. And everything in the human experience outside of those, I guess you could say, two rules basically lies within the realm of personal choice. And mm -hmm. that's it. Like, libertarianism is not complicated. It really, really isn't. And all you have to do at that point is just apply it consistently to, to um, I guess you could say, issue-specific items, you know, in, in the human experience, right? Which, interestingly enough, was what most... See, most people actually try to apply vague, abstract notions to real-world, like, issues of one kind or another, but they don't actually have any real ethical principles to base it on. So they're not actually working from first principles of any kind. And all libertarians are saying is, hey, you know, we have, like, two... Uh, first principles, which are interrelated, which are function as a duality, kind of like day and night or mommy and daddy, so forth. That's the nap and self-ownership. Uh, both of those are justified, I think personally, by argumentation ethics, you know, proving it in the moment, right? And so every mm -hmm. everything in the human experience outside of that is, is personal choice. I mean, for example, um, uh, just because you may uh, decide to drink a, a fifth of scotch does not therefore mean I must drive a pickup truck. You know, there are or or a uh, or a bear blue IPA, which is what I'm drinking now. Sure. The exam. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, there, there are choices that are made which are not of an ethical or moral nature, but just simply, you know, lifestyle choices that are just, you know, whether it's based on aesthetics or whether it's based on uh, vices even. Uh, and, and that's just kind of just what it is. And you see, the problem is that a lot of people see a lot of authority, not to go on too long about this, but I just thought of this. Authoritarians actually want to control other, uh, other people's personal choices. And well, yeah, war on drugs. <laughs> yeah. Or the social engineering of the progressive uh, regressive types. Yeah. With their social justice equality freaks and such. Right. We're going to oh, we're going to shame you because you're a white male Christian cockade or whatever the hell. I mean, that's like. You know, we care about intersectionality. No, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> if you did, you would support men like Alex Ansari, who's half Caucasian, half Afghan. But of course, nobody cares about the Afghan people, but Black Lives Matter. I mean, come on. I mean, this is freaking ridiculous. Anyway, to uh, continue on here, quote, consider the alternative situation egoism. As each situation arises, will I have time to deliberate? To the contrary, most opportunities to coerce are fleeting and require split-second decisions. Uh, Zarenyi. Zarenyi, thank you. And Strakon gave two examples. One, you are one of the two astronauts in a spacecraft returning to Earth. Suddenly you discover that oxygen leaked out, only enough remains for one man. Two, you are alone and see a big wad of bills lying beside an unconscious form in a dark alley. If one hesitates in the first situation, the other astronaut may strike first or barricade himself. In the second situation, the drunk may regain consciousness or someone else may come, close quote. All right, before I turn this over to you for a minute, I, like Murray Rothbard and like Iran, Ayn Rand, I don't like lifeboat scenario hypothetical crap. I'm sorry, I just don't. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a basis for which to, to try and conceptualize um, any sort what, of what you would do in a situation. I mean, it's uh, yeah. It, this is line in the sand, in this dude, dude, dude. This is line huh. in the sand shit. One more time. I mean, this is straight from the fucking patriot movement with their limited government flag waving nationalism bullshit. 
I mean, seriously, no, they do this crap all the time. Believe me, I should know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So, yeah, I, I don't like the lifeboat situations either because, I mean, uh, like, like the first one, I mean, uh, I mean, how many astronauts are going to be, you know, reading uh, the Invictus? What are you going to do when the lights go out? I mean, come on. Really? I'm not saying, you know, a doom porn scenario of the of like a primordial black hole punching through the center of the earth, thereby causing every single volcano on the planet to erupt, causing, uh, what was it, the cloud uh, around the entire planet so like the photosynthesis can occur, therefore we can't grow anything on the surface of the earth and, and thus like, you know, we basically all die of starvation. I mean, that's a doom porn scenario too, which is just as bad as realistic as the Sharia law takeover by Muslims from somewhere. Or, or to put it simpler, you know, what if the lights go out? Like, what if the power goes out here at home? I mean, uh, you know, uh, like right now I could say, well, you know, I'd probably just read a book. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, in that moment, you know, I may decide to clean the house. I mean, it, it, like even just like a simple example like that, I mean, that kind of shows you like uh, like with these very serious examples, you know, like uh, you could die in space because uh, you, you don't have any, any, any oxygen. Uh, or, I mean, you know, you, you could, you know, rob a, rob a, a, rob a passed out drunk. Um, but yeah, or just take like you, you know, trying to figure out what you would do in those situations uh, is a lot harder than uh, than you know me deciding what I'm going to do like if the power goes out for a few hours, and even then I don't know what I'm going to do. So uh, I mean that kind of uh, <laughs> if that if that if that tells you anything about lifeboat scenarios, I don't know. Yeah, and and also before going to the next one, I mean, jeez, friggin' lifeboat scenarios. You know what's a real actual emergency hypothetical thing that's actually really plausible that actually does happen to people every year. Car accidents. It's like, what was it? What is it like? Five figures worth of people are fucking dead because of car accidents every year. Even Walter Block admitted that in his uh, book on uh, the privatization of uh, roads and highways. And what? what let's, let's relate this back to Vanu too. I mean, what, what do you think about like a? Uh, I guess would, would this be considered a lifeboat situation? Uh, like, okay, so I've got my Vanu home base, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what if my Vanu home base is discovered? What will I do? Or would that just be, you know, threat, threat so analysis, in other words, risk, assess, risk so assessment? So in other words, mean time to harassment is now down to zero, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> See previous episode on mean time to harassment. Well, I mean, I guess once you're being harassed, then that's why you should have backup plans in place. And maybe you should have done some drills ahead of time or at least have a vague idea for what you what. Well, let me put it this way. Maybe what's better instead of having the great central plan of what I will do if I'm discovered is maybe have some options. Option A, option B, option C, and try and, you know, kind of keep it, you know, flexible to, you know, to or shall I say battlefield conditions. I'm sick of this crap, and yeah. sorry, I, I, look, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, ladies and gentlemen, like, I love Rayo, but there are just some things I just, with gritted teeth, I don't like what he did, and this is just one of those times where I can see where he was going with it, but he needed a proofreader, damn it. In any case, um, quote, in both situations, one is apt to benefit from coercion of one acts quickly without deliberation. But even those examples involve many considerations. In the spacecraft, more oxygen might be generated by electrolysis of water. Or the men can spend periods in, in a drug-induced coma to reduce oxygen consumption. Even if no alternative to death is immediately apparent, a solution may be found with further thought. Might it not be wiser to chance this or even to join in some cheap-proof form of Russian roulette than to face possible revenge by the other man's friends and relatives back on Earth as well as possible destruction of a craft in a flight? In the second situation, is the drunk still unconscious? Is it a drunk? Might someone be watching from an unseen window? Might it be a trap, perhaps set by non-coercivists to profitably punish or eradicate coercivists, close quote? Now, I would say that's fairly creative, don't you think, Shane? Yes. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's very creative, yeah, for sure. But again, what's with the lifeboat scenarios? Anyway, quote, Karate training emphasizes development of, ho of appropriate habitual responses. A combatant who tries to think through each move is soon disabled. Similarly, someone who hopes to gain from coercion must not only reject principles, he must train himself to spot opportunities and act quickly, else he miss or bungle them. This is one cost of coercion to the coercer. Time, effort, attention, which could otherwise be devoted to other pursuits. Close quote. 
Shane, is it me or is Rayo pretty much mentioning the opportunity costs of... That was exactly the word that was in my mind, brother. <laughs> okay, so that's not just me then. So he's really mentioning opportunity costs at this point. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay, then, then if nothing else, I'll keep yeah, going. Well, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, just, you know, rather than, uh, uh, rather than, you know, uh, uh, put in work on your Vanu home base, you're considering who you're going, you're, you're thinking about, uh, you're, you're thinking about the possibilities of how to coerce others, yeah. The, so just, yeah, right, same. the costs of evil outweigh the costs of good, I suppose. Uh, let's see, quote, a second obvious risk is, a second obvious cost is risk of defense or retribution by the victim or his friends or agents, close quote. Well, I think he just mentioned that a moment ago about dealing with uh, uh, being the subject of revenge by bougrid family members or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep going. Quote, a third cause to the coercer is ostracism. He is not likely to develop close long-term relationships with people he finds desirable. Even other coercivists would rather associate between crimes with those who, who are habitually non-coercive. Even if a coercivist is never caught, even if he never actually commits coercion, he, gi he gives subliminal clues to his attitude and habits through gestures, expressions, inflections, mannerisms, and false starts. He may claim to be non-coercive, but in vain. Others will be uneasy when around him and will prefer to avoid him, although they may not always know why close quote now this is actually very interesting because he actually mentions ostracism by name mm -hmm. and yes he does in a lot of libertarian literature ostracism is mentioned every once in a while sometimes by implication other times explicitly as is the case here uh but i don't think there is a lot of literature uh at least of a libertarian nature that really mentions ostracism explicit or implied is there shane uh, I mean, other than, you know, if uh, someone in the liberty movement uh -oh. uh, is uh, found out to be like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're caught with, you know, a bunch of drugs and they rat out their libertarian and libertarian dealers. I mean, uh, there have been situations like that where if have more people are like, yeah, we shouldn't associate with, associate with this person. They see. Uh, but I don't I don't I don't think they. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, I although I, I'm not sure if ostracism is used by name, but you know when it comes to things like that, you know when people snitch to cops, yeah, libertarians don't like that too much. If you were if you weren't aware, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I think there was also a new one. I think her name was Amanda Bolden, if I remember correctly. Is the lady who started uh, the Shire Society up in New Hampshire. Uh, she ratted out uh, Kyle Tasker, I think his name was. So you know it's it's just kind of like wow, really, that's that that's just low. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Like, um, and actually, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't uh, Sam Conkin too mentioned? I think he called it social shunning, but I think he that he meant ostracism uh, was actually a, a form of um, agorist activity. I think, or at least related to that. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's, it's certainly possible. Certainly possible. But yeah, I, I do like that he mentioned ostracism. Uh, you know, even back, even even back in you know the seventies when he was writing this. But yeah, I mean that's. Uh, yeah, when it comes to coercers, you know, uh, yeah, libertarians don't like that too much. Uh, and if someone, you know, uh, you know, tips off the coercers, uh, even if they aren't a coercer themselves, uh, that's still that's still a no no. <laughs> so I guess I guess me getting kicked out of patriot groups was for my own good, I suppose. Then. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, anyway, quote: How serious a loss this is depends on his lifestyle and goals. If he prefers to drift around the fringes of big cities, forsaking close friendships, his loss may not be great, but achieving freedom will be very difficult. Freedom through wilderness, Vanu, international mobility, urban hideaways, and or black marketeering is enhanced by close trustworthy confederates, close quote. All right, this is actually rather interesting. So, uh -huh. huh, if you prefer to drift around the fringes of big cities for seeking close friendships, his loss may not be great. Okay, well, I guess, okay, so what, is he talking about like doing the Henry Thoreau thing, like Walden? Uh, or, you know, just, just somebody who, uh, you know, uh, you know, moves to a new city, you know, rips off people he can and then moves on to the next one. Uh, I don't have any, you know, concrete examples, but that's kind of what I, so what I almost, imagine. So that uh, almost sounds more like the stereotype of like the 19th century, like uh, uh, potion doctors who would travel from city to city selling their potions and wares. And by the times their victims realized they were scammed, there was no uh, f there was no way of getting restitution. Yeah. Yeah. So, and notice, notice too, in that last sentence of that paragraph, freedom, freedom through wilderness, Vanu, international mobility, urban hideaways, and or market, black marketeering, those different ones. So wilderness, Vanu, that would be kind of like what, what Rayo was doing with his van nomadism, right? 
Yes, yes, and I and he and he's exactly right. I mean, uh, just just using this as an example. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my, uh, I mean, just like for all the work that we've done in the past two years, Kyle, uh, through the Vonnie podcast and, and other projects and things. Uh, I mean, yeah, or, I mean, my, my my thinking is enhanced, and you know, the, the show is improved, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, I'd, I'd hope that uh, you know I had that kind of same impact on you. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it, it's enhanced by you know you know you know relationships, uh, or as he puts it, confederates. Uh, or colleagues, or whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, so yeah, I think he's definitely right about that. I mean, with uh, with Wilderness Vanu, if you have someone, uh, you know, a couple miles away from you that has, you have ammo and he has food, and you guys trade, you know, every once in a while, cool, that works. Uh, but but he wouldn't do that if he knew you were a coercer or if that you're trying to rob him. Uh, international mobility, you know, it might be good to have some people around the globe, like uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're uh, if you're in your sailboats, you know, traveling around, and <laughs> you've got somebody in California who will dock your boat for you. Uh, for ex- for exchange of marijuana or whatever the hell it is, uh, or if you've got somebody you know in the uh, in the Cayman Islands who uh, you know will uh, will will dock your uh, will dock your boat for you or whatever the hell it is. I mean, it, he he is right. You know, it, it, it's it's a lot easier to do things with colleagues than it is to do them completely alone. Uh, division of labor and all, right, Kyle? You're reading human action. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you've you've mentioned the country shopping. He also mentioned an urban hideaway. So that would be the Vanuin cities, wouldn't it? Yeah, and of course exactly. the black marketeering would of course be the uh, ethical enclaves and such. So yeah, for you folks, that those are those are just glimpses into different uh, episodes for season two, by the way. But yeah, Rayo was mentioning it here, so it's kind of an interesting transition point, isn't it? it mm-hmm. All right, so net going on quote: Many freedom achievers are especially sensitive to subliminal indications of attitudes and habits because their freedom, in part, depends on spotting spies and other security risks. They especially are likely to shun a situation egoist. How big a reward might be offered for information? How much could he rip off? Will he be tempted, etc.? Close quote. Well, uh, well, what can I say, Shane? See, I, I know, I, I, I actually know. I, I'm not gonna, not gonna name him by name. I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. But I actually, do know a, you know, an egoist. Uh, you know, a big Max Turner fan, all that good stuff. That's actually how I, I heard of the name of Max Turner was through this person. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually, actually know, uh, no one, no one, no one egoist. Um, but uh, luckily, he's an anarchist, so you know, like, uh, he's not just you know some some you know uh, loosey goosey uh, egoist, so to speak. Like you know, if he's uh, if he's for freedom or if he's for uh, for authoritarianism, you don't know. But but yeah, for him, I know. But yeah, I do actually do know a situ- or I do know an egoist. Wait a minute, hold on. Would that be possible that informants like a Stacey Litz or an Amanda Bolden, hell, maybe even Mark Kessler of all people, free people in the Patriot movement who remember him? Uh, you know, maybe they those different uh, informants and snitches. Maybe they're all situation egoists for all you know. <laughs> or or hell, I mean, consider the. Uh, uh, the all of the uh, informants uh, at the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. Ooh. I mean, all of them getting getting paid, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, you know, like actual like regular employment. Uh, you know, to to snitch yeah, what on was, I uh, think... to snitch on the minarchists. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, situation egoist. Well, I can get three thousand dollars. You know, just for like you know going here and sitting on my ass and doing nothing and then just reporting it back to the FBI. Huh? You know, that's in my rational self-interest. Yeah, not only that, but um, uh, just to use one more example or, or thereabouts, I, I think this was mentioned maybe in an earlier episode, but just to repeat it here, uh, the going raid these days for informants, especially if we go off uh, Oliver Murphy, who informed on Skylar Barbeau, who is another political prisoner. Uh, what's the going rate? It's like, what, 2,500 to 4,000, lower end, upper end, 3,000 being average or thereabouts? Yeah, I mean, I'd say anywhere two, two to two to five thousand dollars. Yeah, depending on how generous and how important uh, the information is. Oh now. man, that's just. I mean, you, you talk about like a nasty. Um, I, I would it be fair to call it the snitching industry? Would that be fair? I don't know. Bad practice. I don't know. State sponsored, uh, secret police type stuff. But it's not the actual secret police. But it's people who work with the secret police. But it's like they're mercenaries. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a topic for another time. But uh, yeah, problem with situation egoists. They are moral relativists, something fierce, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they, they definitely are. And uh, yeah, I think he kind of mentions. Uh, yeah, and I mean, as as I've kind of mentioned, as, as I did kind of mention, you know, uh, you know, freedom achievers, whether they're political crusaders or not. I mean, yeah, they don't take kindly to to, to you know snitches, you know, uh, hurting. Uh, the the folks that they uh, that you know that they may personally know, or you you know just just other people who you know advocate for freedom. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's good to expose uh, what uh, I, I think you kind of, I think you've uh, met, you mentioned it before, maybe not in this podcast, but uh, uh, informant hunting. Oh yeah. So yeah, he's kind of you know 
uh, Rayo said, many freedom achievers are especially sensitive uh, sensitive to subliminal indications of attitudes and habits because their freedom in part depends upon spotting spies and other security risks. So, yeah, well, the I mean, spotting uh, spies would be informant hunting. Well, the spotting, <laughs> well, informant hunt, hunting is just one technique within security culture, isn't it? And so, spotting spies would be part of security culture, which, of course, is what my second book, Just Below the Surface, was all about. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of interesting, too, isn't it? So, again, Rayo is ahead of his time, I, I suppose. Anyway, continuing on, uh, quote, conceivably a coercivist uh, might become such a good actor, his friends would never catch on. But this entails the greatest cost of all. He must constantly suppress, inhibit, fake, and live in fear of a slip giving him away. I doubt that he can do this and retain a deep capacity for joy, and without his successful ripoffs, will be hollow triumphs, close quote. That's interesting. He must be a good actor and, and f- suppress, inhibit, and fake and live in fear of a slip giving him away. I don't know, man. That sounds an awful lot like Ayn Rand's actually first novel, which was We the Living, which was all based in um, uh, Soviet Russia. Because in Soviet Russia, car drives you. Little in-joke or, there. Or, <laughs> or recently, uh, <laughs> in, in America, TV spies on you. <laughs> uh, yeah, really, anyways, right. Yeah, you know, the Vault 7 stuff, right? Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, it's it's very fascinating that, again, being a good actor, suppressing, inhibiting, and faking, and living in fear of a slip giving him away. I don't know, man. I mean, do you think we're living in the Soviet Union now? I mean, because I mean, that's kind of like what, what Rayo was kind of getting, although he was writing this during the Cold War. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 an, if an individual is going to, you know, carry on a life of, of coercing others, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, he, he's, he's in a group or, or something along those lines, I mean, yeah, that, that would be kind of necessary, and I, and I do agree with him, like, if, if I couldn't, you know, you know, I, I don't like this term because it's used in the mainstream, it sounds really, really, really stupid, but, you know, expressing yourself, <laughs> uh, like, like I, I express myself through both podcasts I do. I express, express myself through articles when I actually write one. I haven't done one in a while. But, uh, but you know, I, I, I like, you know, you know, I like doing that. <laughs> I do. Uh, so, you know, if, if I couldn't do that and I had to keep everything, you know, bottled up, uh, and not in the, not in the terms of, not in the terms of like frustration or anything, just, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, <laughs> I like to do this sort of thing. So if I had to do that, yeah, I don't think it, I don't think my life would be very joyful. I mean, I'd just be doing my nine to five right now, saving up, doing the frugality thing, and you know, just just hoping for better days. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think he's I think he's correct there. I mean, just with my example personally. Well, let me just offer one possible comparison before continuing on here. Would it be possible that the good actor in this case, who's suppressing, inhibiting, and faking? What would make the uh, what type of uh, personality or type of person would make the good actor? Maybe I would suggest perhaps a dare shall I say it a controlled schizophrenic might be the best good actor around. See previous episode on controlled schizophrenics. Huh. I mean, think about it. I mean, yeah. if you consider what was mentioned in that episode about controlled schizophrenics, I mean, they I mean, they can suppress inhibit and fake and they don't even have to try because they believe in their crazy double think. So in fact, let me put it this way, yeah. an honest coercer, I think, would have a harder time constantly suppressing, inhibiting, and faking, and living in fear of a slip giving him away than a controlled schizophrenic who genuinely believes in his contradictory Orwellian doublethink, where he believes in two yeah. absolutely complete opposite ideas at the same time. Oh, yes, he goes to church and accepts their standard of morality, but he's not above having a drink at a nude bar. You know, he, he's rational in his work, because, but he keeps his rationality compartmented. But he dares not, you know, question his life, you know, as a whole. Yeah, that's a good point. So huh. maybe, maybe one candidate or a personality type for the good actor suppressing, inhibiting, and faking would be a controlled schizophrenic because it's genuine. Instead of somebody who's, you know, who actually has to work at it because they're an actual monster an actual authoritarian like a Hillary Clinton type who actually has to work at it as opposed to controlled schizophrenic who, uh, whoa, they're... Th- that's, that's kind of their day-to-day life, right? You know, just kind of, you know, tricking people. <laughs> right, but I would go one more step. I think it's even worse for them in some sense because the, it's actually genuine. They really do believe it. And then from there, that's where you get your collective, as was mentioned in previous episodes, that's where you get your collective movementism. That's where you get your political crusading. And then more generally, that's where you get the servile society more generally, which, of course, is the enemy of the Venuans. 
So if it's the case that controlled schizophrenia is underneath that, well, then, as, as was mentioned in previous episodes, then when you go back to well, then when you're looking at this article about the good actor, well, who would count as the good actor? I would suggest that there's also other possibilities, and I would suggest this to the listeners. They may want to think about what would uh, what type of personalities would count or be candidates for the good actor as Rayo explains it, the good actor who constantly suppresses, inhibits, and fakes and lives in fear of a slip giving him away. Something to chew on there. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll consider that, too. Yeah, I definitely would. All right. Hmm. So, going on, quote, Could a band of coercivists avoid these problems by agreeing not to coerce each other, only outsiders? This is often attempted. Every state is such an attempt. But without a general principle of some kind, any agreement is without basis. Some will turn on others the first time they perceive an advantage, and this possibility leads to distrust and sometimes preemptive strikes, close quote. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, whether we're looking at a form of government like monarchy or we're looking at a form of government like the uh, democratically Republican or, shall we say, hypothetically limited government, whatever the hell, uh, yeah, I think Rayo hit it on the head on this one. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Every every state every state is is an attempt of a band of coercivists, uh, you know, to only coerce each other. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think that's correct. I mean, how many how many times have, have, have uh, uh, I know I've seen a lot of a lot of times where I got to reward I got to re reward a lot of senses because I want to use the word we uh, just for 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 those for those listening. I, I don't want to screw up and and fall and uh, you know do what we told you not to do. <laughs> please see, pre but, please see uh, previous episode on collective <laughs> movementism. But I, I know I've seen plenty of times where, you know, I mean, just, uh, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton talk, uh, uh, otherwise known as Hillary Clinton. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, they, pr they protect their own. They protect their own. Um, now, I mean, obviously, there's some some infighting and such. I mean, uh, I don't want to get into I don't want to mention this, but uh, I mean, yeah, they, they the course of is going at each other. I mean, the NSA versus the CIA, the deep state versus Trump or whatever. I mean, there's there's all there's those sorts of things that are supposedly happening, but no one really knows if they are or not, whatever. Um but uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I would, I would definitely, you know, tend to believe that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, contention and some, some disagreement, and you know, the coercers going after the other coer coercers. Uh, so I, I think he's, I think he's, he's definitely right about that, and he's definitely right about the fact that, you know, that in his description of like that as, as being, you know, every single state that's existed throughout history. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's right. <laughs> there is no loyalty among thieves. To maybe put it a little bit more simply, and uh, yeah, so when when the different political crusaders are, uh, I think you were mentioning some items from the news cycle and even some more historical things, right? And 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 people will focus on that because it's in the news cycle, but it has actually nothing to do with what you and I arguably ought to be doing in our daily lives and such, right? Well, yeah, and that's got yeah, that's kind of uh, and, and just 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 real real quick tangent, real quick tangent. Uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of what Rayo mentioned in the book too. He, like uh, whenever they speak, whenever he, he spoke to others, and I think this was about the time he disappeared. But uh, uh, he would, you know, meet up with people, or the rare times he did, and they'd be like, "Did you hear about this new technology that the that whatever government agency has, they're gonna find you." And and he's just like, I mean, yeah, we'll just have to, you know, adapt and you know, become more uh, uh, competent. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, so that, that was kind of his, his reaction to it is, I, I know that, I mean, they're, they're going to get better technology and, and, uh, we, you know, with the concrete, we here, we as Vanuans, you know, have to, have to, you know, adapt and, and, you know, uh, become more competent. Right. And regarding, uh, so that was his kind of and regarding that specific example, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that his reasoning was based on the law of diminishing marginal utility or the law of diminishing returns or something like that, where basically yeah, every yeah. law enforced <laughs> means they have, uh, the state has less resources, manpower, funding, et cetera, to actually go and persecute people. So if that's the case, then shouldn't libertarians, or I guess not libertarians, but let's not libertarians, but shouldn't you know those who are like, oh, there's too many law, like the conservatives, like there are too many laws on the books, we need to repeal some of those. If that really is the case, and I think it, I think it is, shouldn't they be advocating for more laws? That would be definitely one very unique way of putting <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, it would. But you see, here's the problem: is that political crusaders are economically illiterate. And if people were and they're rational, but yeah, go ahead. Well, there's that too. But political crusaders, in my observations, have always been economically illiterate. In fact, 
I'm trying to honestly think of any type of political crusaders, whether in a collective, you know, ideological sense or even just individuals I've known who have uh, been economically illiterate. And I honestly can't think of um, either form. I can't think of an ideology that would fit that where they say democracy and elections, but they actually understand like the spontaneous order of the market. And uh, I don't know, man, it's just. I'm honestly, I mean, the two don't coincide. I mean, generally speaking, if you're in favor of the God that failed, which is democracy specifically, uh, yeah, generally speaking, you're not going to have appreciation for markets. That's, that, I mean, that that seems to be pretty consistent. So political crusaders uh, of various types and flavors really are just economically illiterate. And so, you know, for those of us who actually do try to understand the world, whether in terms, well, again, human action is purposeful behavior, right? Acting men use means in order to achieve certain ends. A lot of people have a problem, at least from ones I've talked to, Shane, in private conversations over the years, have a lot of um, trouble understanding that, even if whether it's phrased that way or not. I mean, they really don't have any concept of integrity, really. Everything is just really kind of like, what I feel, my feels, right? You know, I... Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an emotion, emotion-driven, sens sens sensationalism-driven, you know, kind of... I know, I know you don't like the word, but society that that's uh, that's kind of exists around us today. And they wonder so. why they have dysfunctional relationships and, and 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 to use one type of example, dysfunctional families. And they wonder, it's like why? I mean, even even in even in the um, cultural fiction, uh, pop fiction, popular fiction of the servile society, the theme of dysfunctional relationships is so prevalent, whether it be of a romantic nature, platonic, or more of a familial kind of of, uh, of setup. It's always dysfunctional, right? A lot of comedies. Yes. It, it's, it's constant and in your face all the damn time uh, for, for those people who actually partake in that kind of thing. And I'm just going off of my memory here. But yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's kind of like, well, if you're working off mixed premises or no premises at all, then don't be – it's kind of like – again, like Rayo himself said elsewhere, right? It's like building your house, uh, house's foundation on, on quicksand rather than uh, on, on a solid rock foundation or something similar. You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, it's a little hard to feel, you know, empathy or sympathy for the guy who is foolish enough to build his foundation on something malleable versus someone who built his foundation on something solid. And see that. So so, so to really this back to Vaughn, uh, you know, building your life on, you know, the unstable, uh, dysfunctional, you know, servile society uh, versus, uh, you know, what a Vaughn home base uh, would be kind of, you know, the the the, uh, the kind of examples to the concrete examples that you're kind of or, or as is the case here with this particular article is is i guess in one sense it is abstract so i would agree with rayo on that but i would also go further one step more and agree with hans Hermann hop that it's provable in the moment right okay so just run through this one more time you're talking you've been talking and i've been talking this entire time right and we take that is that is a valid statement. okay and and we're we're not and by our actions we're not punching punching each other in the face right so we forsworn the initiation of the use of force, right? True, yes. At the same time, you're responsible for your statements and I'm responsible for my statements, right? Yes, uh, for sure. Okay, so therefore, self-ownership is proven in the here and now, and it's it's here, and and also we're, we're obeying the NAP, or as Rayo called it, you know, the ethical principle of, of non-coercion and such. So even this very episode of TVP that you folks are listening to right now we're actually obeying argumentation ethics and argumentations as a logical proof that we're not actually contradicting each, you know, we're not contradicting ourselves. And not only that, but the argumentation ethics is also can be subjected to argumentation ethics, right? You can't do that with social contract theory. The Social contract theory actually violates the social contract, just like the divine right of kings violates the divine right of kings. Think about it this way, folks. <laughs> the scientific method, the scientific method of empiricism and, you know, the different stages of actually testing a hypothesis and eventually getting to the point of a scientific theory and all that, the scientific method itself is subjected to the scientific method. In other words, it's internally consistent. Argumentation ethics works, as, works a similar way. And I think in a manner of speaking, Rayo was trying to kind of do something similar here with his ethical principle of non-coercion. He was trying to, trying to try to see if he could make it work in terms of finding something that was internally consistent. Yes, and well said. Yeah, that was that was. I enjoyed listening to that. I know they will too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have said it earlier. It just popped in my head. Uh, well, I, I, what what can I say? I'm a scientist first and a and a partisan last. But anyway, because it's like truth and reality and facts actually matter to me. 
However, at the same time, I also don't want to spend the rest of my life cooped up in some lab somewhere, you know, going, you know, doing 50 million studies just to prove like 1% of the human experience is actually happening too. There, there, there is actually, and yes, I just made a time preference reference, by the way. You know, in terms of time <laughs> preference, I don't have that much time left in my natural lifespan. Even if everything idealistically goes well for me, I have to be very careful with my time. So I can't do like 50 million different studies. You know, I can do studies on some more utilitarian things to be sure of a more empirical nature and such. But for other things, I think argumentation ethics can bring those opportunity costs down. Uh, but yeah, in any case, to, to read the last paragraph of, of this article by Rayo, quote, I do not claim that adopting non-coercive ethics is in the self-interest of everyone. But I conclude that for myself, at least, and probably for most who seek to control their own lives, non-coercivism will maximize efficiency, probable safety, trade opportunities, and emotional capacity, close quote. <sighs> Again, it just seems to be utilitarian here. But he, I, I mean, I, I agree with him, though. I mean, yeah, you, you know uh uh, you know, having positive interactions or maybe even, you know, maybe that's that's uh, providing a, a value judgment, you know, uh, um, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll go for it. Yeah. You know, having, you know, having beneficial, you know, um, interactions with folks uh, is better than having, you know, non-beneficial interactions with folks, folks, whether that's trade, whether it's for, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, communication or whatever the hell it is. Um, and yeah, safety, if you can trust the people that you're around, if you vetted them properly and, and you know, they aren't a coercer, then cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's not bad to have some of those. It's it's it's, it's certainly not bad to uh, you know have conversations and and you know hang out with folks like that. Um, but yeah, I I think he's right, but I I also think that uh, it may be a little utilitarian, right? <laughs> yeah. So so as we kind of begin to kind of close out here, I don't know, man. Having having gone through you know this article you know again for the umpteenth time, at least myself personally, right? At least in some sense. I don't know. I, I think Rayo was was pioneering a lot of different things and so forth, and I appreciate his effort here. It's just, you know, he wrote this back in um, in seventy two December of December nineteen seventy two. Right. It's twenty seventeen as we record this, and you know, I just got to say, man, you know, even if freedom didn't work uh, for like the you know the the maximum benefit for the most number of people. And there really was no utilitarian justification for freedom. I still don't think that would invalidate it, even if, let's say, hypothetically, even if freedom was very unequal. Oh, now the social justice people are going to go twist their knickers or whatever. Even if freedom really was unequal, uh, at least in some sense, and it didn't work in the uh, majority rule sense in terms of like majorities of people and maximum benefits for majorities or whatever. Um, I would still say that, you know, maybe Kant's categorical imperative does have something to offer here, because remember, a lot of the natural, oh, maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, Kant's categorical imperative in a lot of ways is actually the basis for like the natural rights or natural law tradition, or the deontological libertarianism, by the way. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I, wow, now that I think about it, so maybe that's why Rayo was pretty hostile earlier in the article where he was basically ascribing Kant's categorical imperative as being mystical. Because maybe he was viewing it as being arbitrary. But then, of course, unfortunately, you could also say the utilitarian position is arbitrary, too, because it depends what your operating parameters are. It depends what your, well, as with, as, as Rayo tried to do earlier, the lifeboat scenarios were kind of silly. And, and, and you should, I mean, it's something to keep in mind for, you know, for, for the listeners, too, that, you know, the objectivists don't like Immanuel Kant. Uh, there was there's one present there was one presentation I can't remember what it's called I shouldn't even mention it here but it was like an eight hour long thing it was probably like a week long seminar like an objectivist seminar and it was essentially just like a tirade against Immanuel Kant Immanuel Kant on on uh, like has, has just he's infiltrated every single you know uh, line of thinking uh, his work has and that's why you know that his categor categorical imperatives can be for good or for ill uh, and you know when I mean some of, some of Mises' arguments were you know Kantian. Uh, Hoppe, you know, comes from that school of thought. Uh, that's 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 non-debatable. Uh, so I mean, it, it, I mean, you can take that to justify the most brutal, uh, br brutal form of authoritarianism, or it can be, you know, kind of, you know, be, be uh, you know, synthetic a priori's. Uh, you know, it can it can help to, you know, formulate uh, argumentation ethics. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so there is that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, dude. So, any closing thoughts to leave the listeners with? I guess all I have is is that uh, I mean th this was I think we're, we're, we we've kind of seen again Kyle that <laughs> I mean you and I we uh, 
because I remember reading this. I've read this a handful of times too, and I read it just before you know we 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 recorded this podcast. But you know, going through it line by line and kind of talking about it, yeah, this is a lot like the libertarians and coercivists uh, article that we read uh, for TVP number eight, I think it was, where uh, when we kind of you know kind of like break this down, uh, there there's there's some issues with it. Um, so, so so there's that again. The, there's that. I mean, disagreements with Rayo. Uh, which is why, you know, I, I, I tend to, you know, non-aggression principle, you know, uh, initiatory force is wrong. It's much like the golden, it's, it's, it's pretty much the golden rule only applies to government as well. Uh, it's a lot simpler explanation. You don't have to go through ego utilitarianism, utilitarianism, egoism, uh, any of that stuff. Um, I mean, some of it may be valuable, some of it may not be, but, uh, but either way, when, when you're trying to communicate these ideas to, you know, just average individuals, uh, the folks that you know watch uh, watch The Bachelor or The Bachelorette or whatever the hell it is, uh, you, you've got you've got to cater to your audience. And if you if you if you send them this article saying here's why you shouldn't violate other people's rights, uh, they'll probably read the first pair the first line and just kind of like you know toss it and then go back to watching TV. Yeah. Uh, so so there there is that there there is that as as well. Um, but but you know Vanu isn't about you know proselytizing. Um, but in regards to this article, I do think, you know, if, if you're, if you're going to, you know, try to, try to bring others to this philosophy, you know, not as, not as like, you know, a collective movementism type of thing, but, you know, there's nothing wrong, like with, with, with podcasts. I mean, we're, we're, Kyle, you and I are introducing like some of these ideas, people probably for the first time. Uh, so, so I, I mean, <laughs> so I, it, it's not bad to, you know, bring other, bring other people in, uh, and to introduce them to these ideas. But uh, if you're going to do that, I mean, at least know your know your target audience and market appropriately. Uh, don't don't send them if you, like, again. If you're talking to one of these uh, one of these uh, you know TV bachelor type people, uh, you probably shouldn't send them the argumentation ethics PDF. Probably wouldn't be a wise idea. Uh, so so yeah, just it, it, it's about marketing. It's about marketing. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that would be one way of putting it. I mean, obviously, there was my article, uh, actually, this same time last year, actually, was when it came out. It was entitled Some Thoughts on Argumentation Ethics, which, of course, was part of the larger uh, argumentation ethics anthology by that was put up by LUA Publications, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I would just say this. I do appreciate Rayo's article in terms of his critique of uh, egoism, especially of the Sterner variety. I do think that was good because I view Stern, me personally, I just view Sterner as as a moral relativist, and I just kind of leave it at that. Um, I mean, I think the guy's got some good phrases like the collective of spooks and exorcising said, said spooks from your head and so forth. But as a anarchic school of thought, I'm not exactly a big fan or a fan of uh, the egoist anarchism by by a long shot, because I think there were some other problems related to that, which would be uh, probably better save for another time, right? Um, as far as the rest of the article goes, I think Rayo was was striking probably some new ground for the time when when he wrote it, but I think there's been better development since then. And I think probably the most important one, of course, would be Hans Hermann Hopp with his argumentation ethics probably being the most important development. And so, yeah, I guess you could say I, I'm a Vanuist who prefers argumentation ethics, at least in the sense as, as it being a logical proof, you know, logically deductive and, and, and a proof, not an opinion, not uh, some vague uh, belief, but a proof of the private property ethic of the NAP of self ownership as a duality that interlocks and 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 balances it it's itself out I guess would be one way kind of like a yin and a, yin and a yang I suppose um, to to have like a holistic uh, basically uh, ethical basis from which to um, from which to judge human action because remember you know the free market is the sum of all voluntary human action but remember there's also the human action that's not voluntary that's coercive right. And the whole point of Vanu, other, other, otherwise known as the political means, but yes, right. And the whole point of Vanu is to make yourself as invulnerable to said coercion as possible. And yes, yeah, said coercion is itself a, a form of human action, right? I mean, when you look at these disgusting politicians and other tyrants, they are engaging in. If you think it, just just hold on a second. If you, they're actually engaging in a yeah, form look, of personal look behavior. At it. Look, yeah, look at it praxeologically and with value, value free. Yes, yes. I mean, they, they are, you know, they are, you know, it, it is human. It, it is human action. They are, you know, uh, some of them, you know, may have like this benevolent idea that, you know, uh, that the local bureaucrat here thinks that she's going to make the roads safer. She may really <laughs> think that. Um, and praxeologically, I mean, those are the means that she choose, chooses to, you know, reach those ends. Now, with value added into it, I think she's a, 
uh, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, road socialist. Kind of just just choose just choose a line of words, and it'll probably fit in there. So so anyways. <laughs> right, right. An authoritarian tire and a road socialist, as Dr. Walter Block would put it, and so forth, right? So if you actually look at tyrants, at rulers— or those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers, which uh, which is a little bit more clunky phrase, even though it is more accurate, because it's a it's a hallucination they have uh, about uh, because they have a lust for power. You know, they are engaging in purposeful behavior, right? If you, for example, if you want to murder thousands to millions of people and not go to prison for it because it's legal, well, then of course you would have to join up with the state, right? I mean, that, that's really the only way to do it and have it be fairly foolproof or mostly foolproof. And see, that's... Yeah, yeah, even, even, even you know, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, mafias and things like that. I mean, they, they, they do have some sort of, uh, some, sort of, some sort of invulnerability to that coercion, but it's not, it's not you know, ironclad. I remember I mean, those mafia, guys. Mafia, mafias get taken down and such, but governments, I mean, you're, you're, you're relatively safe in government yeah. uh, uh, as far as coercing people. So yeah, you, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, if you're, if you're a coercivist, Oh, uh, you probably shouldn't be listening to this podcast in the first place. Uh, but uh, but you know, value free if if that's what you value. I mean, go join government, but please don't. I mean, there's there's already enough enough assholes in there. Anyway. Well, hey, it's just you know, just go get, go and do something. Just, just go and do something else, like anything else. Don't go, don't go work for. Well, government. hey, you know, the state attracts coercivists, authoritarians of of various flavors. The state attracts criminal types of various flavors to itself, like a moth to a flame. Because it actually accentuates and legitimizes uh, that you know various forms of criminality. I mean, hell, Frederick Bastia called it legal plunder, legal plunder, like the fact like it's legal and stuff, and it's plunder. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, but this doesn't take you know a PhD in philosophy to figure this stuff out. Yeah, and, and those folks who do have PhDs in philosophy never ever ever venture down that line. They have their their one sort of you know kind of what 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 their Whatever their particular subject of study is, that's what they focus on, and they're in this in this goddamn bubble, and they never leave it. I remember, uh, and this is actually this is actually very very relevant here, Kyle. That's, I'm glad I thought of this, but I went and met with my uh, philosophy teacher. I kind of enjoyed him. I mean, it was it was he wasn't you know like a raging socialist. I mean, he 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 kept his opinion out of it until the last day of class, and I appreciated that, you know, uh, because most most uh, you know uh, indoctrinators love to inject their opinion onto the. The hapless minds uh, of those at uh, the, the hapless, very influential minds, uh, the very influenced minds at uh, high level indoctrination. So I actually went and met with him and talked about, you know, the non-aggression principle uh, and, uh, and and self ownership, and and I was like, you know, I think this is kind of like the line of ethics that you know people, you know, like people already kind of adhere to this. I mean, I think if if people just like do it consciously, it'd be it'd be, pretty, be a pretty good thing, and society would improve. Uh, and like it was just so foreign to him, just so foreign. Mm. He's like, what? Yeah, yeah, and I, I he's 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 still back in the 1700s, and we're here in the 2017s. Uh, at that time, 2016, but still, he's back. You know, reading all the stuff from 20, you know, the 1700s, and trying to you know like refine the arguments there, uh, without any bearing on reality. So, I think that's a you know yeah philosopher you know PhD philosophers don't have really any damn interest in those folks at all. I don't know what Hans Hermann Hoppe has, but uh, but he he kind of you know observes reality and, and kind of goes from there, but. <laughs> well, let me well, let me put yeah. let me put it this way, man. I mean, like people just to kind of as we start to close out here, you know, people have kind of called me an intellectual over the years, and I do consider that fighting words, because I ain't no egghead. Okay, I have very little, if any, anything in common at all with those people who are basically stuck in their own little ivory towers. And I graduated from college. Okay, so I know what the hell I'm talking about. I've been there. I've gone to office hours. I've done all that stuff. You probably done done something similar too when when you, you were uh, when you were still you know in there and all that uh, where, where you mm -hmm. were. Yeah. So you know it's it's kind of like you know, geez. I mean, when you say like uh, when you were mentioning earlier about they're stuck in their own little you know bubbles and all that, that's very true. And very rarely will you have like a Hans Hermann Hoppe type or uh, a Ludwig von Mises or, uh, yeah, even Rothbard, right? Because Rothbard, unfortunately, was a political crusader. However, to his credit, he was not uh, an, an uh, ivory tower type. He was actually out in the world trying things. His problem was that he was just into political crusading, right? Especially with the toward, LP. Toward, 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 towards, the, yeah, uh, yeah, towards the end of his life, definitely. Yeah, maybe maybe me mediocre uh, towards, <laughs> towards the middle of his life. Sure, but. sure. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, so there are some academics, there are some intellectuals who actually do honestly try to make the world a better place, perhaps, uh, maybe not consistently always, but at least they make the effort. 
Uh, but that's not the norm, is it? At least from from what you've seen, that uh, a lot of these court no. intellectuals, much like their monarchist predecessors, are really just kind of uh, legitimizing uh, the rulership, aren't they? And that's their primary function. Look also at how they're funded. You know where? You know, what, what's the old adage for investigative reporting? Follow the money. Yeah, yep, who, yep, who's yep. financing these intelligentsia? Just uh, something for people to kind of chew on. So, well, yeah, public public uni public universities. Yeah, oh, I mean that's God. that's that's yeah that that that's kind of obvious. But I guess what one like if, if any of you, uh, and hopefully you're not, hopefully you're not. Uh, but if you are, I mean, yeah, it's, it's your choice. But I, I've 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 never been happier than you know. I got my associate's degree and I got the I got the got the hell out of there. So, uh, but if you're still in there and you take an ethics philosophy class, you know. Uh, uh, and you you know you you've you've kind of looked into argumentation ethics. Uh, you're you know you know you know you're a libertarian or an anarchist, a voluntarist that you know uh, uh, abides by you know, the non-aggression principle. Introduce that idea in class, or you know in private hours, office hours, Ooh. and just see the reaction that you get. It's so foreign. Not using force. What is this? What is he talking about? <laughs> Dumb child. Get out of my office. No, I, I never got any reactions like that. Like the. They get out of my office part, but I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of like starry-eyed. Like, I'm still in seventeen. Seven, I'm still in eighteenth uh, century Europe. What, what are you talking about here, kid? Yeah, so it's what? like it's almost like a Renaissance period, or maybe even medieval or feudal Europe, right? At least in some sense. So, uh, other than uh, your uh, recommended homework assignment, uh, any other closing closing thoughts? No, no, n none other than I hope you guys enjoyed the. Uh, it was a very loose discussion. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, very, very philosophical. But uh, again, in just a couple episodes, a few episodes, a couple of few, something like that, uh, we'll be into the action portion. Uh, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, <laughs> the more philosophical discussion here, uh, relating to you know what Ray wrote about back uh, in the seventies and what what was kind of on his mind then. And uh, again, I think you know him even you know writing an article on this subject. Uh, is, is is quite spectacular. So that's all I have. Right. So so yeah, folks, definitely consider uh, Shane's recommended homework assignment of sorts. That when you have when you have your conversations with people, even if you're not in college, and uh, you bring up uh, basically the issue about the uh, initiation of force and really the prohibitions against the initiation of force, bring it up and then just watch the reactions. And uh, then I think you'll you'll learn quite a bit about the nature of the world you happen to live in. Uh, again. Yep, and if it and if it doesn't scare the, if that doesn't make you if doesn't if that doesn't uh, you know uh, scare you even more about the servile society then uh, I don't know what to tell right, you. Right, <laughs> see previous episode on the servile society. In any case, that's all we have for you. Thanks so much for tuning in. The website is vanupodcast.com. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>